So good evening. Um, thank you all for joining us for this wonderfully immersive journey of Matthew Barney's The Cremaster Cycle. Um, of course, this journey continues um, throughout this weekend, tomorrow with the UK premiere at the English National Opera um, of Matthew Barney and Jonathan Bepler's The River of Fundament. And due to popular demand, there has been an additional screening added on Monday, so please do um, join us for these celebrations um, if you would like to. Um, it is uh, absolute um, honor and pleasure to be introducing this conversation. Um, as many of you will know, the Whitechapel is a gallery um, that has a history of bringing legendary artists to the British public, from Rothko and Rauschenberg to Picasso and Pollock, often presenting their work for the first time. And it is a great pleasure to introduce to you Matthew Barney, a living legend, um, and to be celebrating his work here today. I'm going to pass over now in a second, but just to let you know that Matthew will be joined in conversation with James Lingwood, who is co-director of Art Angel. And this is an interesting um, point because as my colleague Ivana Blazuk, director of the gallery, introduced earlier, um, it was James Lingwood through his work with Art Angel who commissioned the first um, produced Cremaster cycle, Cremaster 4, in 1994, which celebrates, I suppose, 20 years now um, since the, that first work. Um, so I'm going to pass over. There'll be time to ask questions after the conversation, um, but please do wait for the mics. There'll be mics coming around to you. But without further ado, I'll pass to Matthew and James. Thank you. Right. Welcome, Matthew. And, um I noticed in your CV that uh, you were not so long ago re uh, awarded a Persistence of Vision in Art Award. So, uh, and I think we also thank, want to welcome this audience for Persistence in Watching <laughs> Award this evening. And it's great that you've, you've stayed on for, for this session. We're going to talk together for 20, 25 minutes, and we, um, then the floor will be yours. So please um, uh, think of what questions you'd like to ask Matthew, because these these uh, events don't come around very often. In fact, I think it was over 10 years ago that the Cremaster Cycle was last presented in London. Um, I think it's, it's reasonably well known that you, you sketched out the arc of the Cremaster Cycle of, of five separate parts um, before, you, before you started um, making the first of the films. Um, did you have any sort of model in mind, uh, you know, in terms of artistic form? I and mean, were you thinking about performance or opera or, I mean, what, what was behind this kind of sketch of five, part, five parts? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, I think you will remember um, some of the things that you and I spoke about uh, when we started looking at locations in the sort of the region around um, the UK, um, at, at the time at the time I was um, thinking about um, locations in Ireland. I was thinking about um, Scotland. Uh, I traveled around a lot uh, to find to finally find the Isle of Man as a location. But um, I think the thing about the Isle of Man that ended up aligning with something that I had been thinking about was to do with broadcast, actually. It was to do with the, the TT race that happens there once a year and the possibility of, of these five locations being um, broadcast in, in, in more in a conceptual way, you know, not necessarily in a literal way, but um, that that along the lines of an earthwork um, or a non-site, that, that these places would happen in five, these stories would happen in five different locations and they would be kind of theoretically broadcast back to one sort of form. And, um, and so, yeah, so the, the Isle of Man, I think, kind of put that into, into uh, some kind of focus for me. And I remember we had these meetings with Channel 4 and BBC, and we, like, we actually talked about the possibility of broadcasting the work, which didn't happen, right? It was a missed opportunity for BBC. <laughs> um, 
When you think about, talk about broadcast, um, does that also relate to the fact that you wanted, there was a perf live, performative kind of feel to, to your work at that time, that you, you wanted to relay back to another site? Well, I, I mean, I think the work that was done previous to Korea Master had, you know, it had this uh, um, hybridity, let's say, between a real-time document and a, uh, a suggestion or a proposal for something that may or may not have happened. There were these multi-channel installations where um, some of the material you were seeing was just a trace of what had happened in the space, where other things were much more, um, um, you know, reliant on effects, um, speed change, um, kind of light effects, uh, things that kind of removed the, the concrete uh, feeling from it. And, and I was kind of preoccupied with that at that time, of trying to combine those things. And so um, I think that carried over into, into Cremaster in that way that, that um, and particularly in thinking about the Isle of Man, the first one, that, that, that I wanted it to both be something that may have happened, but, um, but to break that logic with, um, um, you know, with another sensibility. Mm -hmm. I mean, as the, the cycle evolved, mm -hmm. um, Crew Master 4 being the first and then, and then one, um, you had some of these sites in mind, but how close did you stick to your original script for the, the evolution of the, of the cycle? Mm -hmm. Well, for example, uh, I think Istanbul was the original idea for the, like the, the, the condition of the thermal bath. You know, it, was, it was really to do with heat. You know, it was right. about the heat of the water bringing the, the um, sexual organs down. And, um, and I ended up, I guess I ended up getting interested in the way that, that Houdini could become a part of the story if it took place in Hungary. So we sort of switched at, at a certain point from uh, Istanbul to, to uh, Budapest. Uh, a similar thing happened with the, the move from uh, Ireland to the Isle of Man, White Sands, Desert was uh, was at once in, uh, the location before it became the the salt flats in Utah. So, you know, so there were they think things changed as I started traveling and doing the research and um, and um, and land locking in these locations. So you have a you have in a sense a strong conceptual framework. This mm -hmm. this epic uh, biological story, but it's your field research, as it were, that gives the... I mean, it seems like you arrive, in a, you arrive in, a, in, a, in a setting and then you kind of... you absorb um, into, your, into the body of your work a lot of um, materials, uh, signs, rituals, which are very specific to that place, which, you, you know, you may not have known all about before. Even. Mm. Yeah, no, it's true. So the... I said, so the initial in instinct is, is often a, a, a more of an uh, intuitive one. And the, the in way that... In, the the, in terms of the site? Well, yeah, I think in terms of the initial drawing, let's say, that was made from west to east, and, and these locations, um, you know, were suggestive to me um, for uh, one reason or the other. And then... Um, the stories weren't, the individual stories weren't developed until I was able to go and immerse myself in the place and start to draw the, the, the local mythologies and materials, as you're saying, from, from each of those lo locations and then produ produce the work. So that, that, that was done one step at a time, really. Mm -hmm. um, the, the first location in... Um is in your, your hometown in, a, in the States, right? Uh, and um, there's a sense of there being a personal connection also to New York, 
which is where you were uh, working through the, and you continue to work. Um, you know, is there some kind of autobiographical dimension within this? Uh, for sure, yeah. I mean, I think it was very much uh, an autobiographical piece in that way. And, and, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about recently, speaking about the, about River Fundament, you know, which is, which is not. And it's a much easier piece to talk about for that reason, which is interesting. <clears throat> seem to sort of in a, nonetheless travel away from, from places which are more easily connected to your own story, to ones which are less so, so from the States over to the, mm -hmm. to the East, possibly away from self in some way, I don't know. Mm. Yeah, but I think in the way that, that number two is very much about a genealogical um, kind of uh, movement, you know, through, through the landscape um, and through the narrative that it, that it moves through generations in, in that story that, you know, so too does the movement of the, the Cree Master Cycle in general, that it sort of starts in a more um, personal place and then it moves through the, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, through New York, as you're saying, um, which was sort of the, my workplace, you know, to the, um, to where my bloodlines come from, and then into a place that's sort of more about, um, let's say, a, a, a mythological connection that I wanted to make, um, or a connection to, um, something that I feel I had inherited and um, uh, not through blood. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's to do with the, the um, you know, the es escapology or the, 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 the Houdini condition. That went. Mm -hmm. So, um, so it, it, it does do that. It, 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 uh, it travels through several stages of um, of autobiographical perspective somehow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the work is, is you know, through the, the years that the, the films were successively being uh, put out, completed and put out there, um, the first kind of terms of reference were very close to the way that you had spoken about the work in relation to this, the drama of biology, the, the differentiation of, uh, uh, of, of sexual differentiation. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I have the feeling that gradually a sort of a more a Freudian kind of analysis began to apply, get applied to the work more. Um, you know, do you, I mean, how do you feel about that sort of framework? I mean, was it, was it part of your conception of the piece or is this something that has, as it were, began to kind of be connected to it by other writers and critics? Well, I think, I think that the, that the, uh, I th one thing that, that, ch that changed over time for me was the, the relationship to uh, the language of cinema, I think, you know, that I think where it started was more, um, it was more to do with the language of broadcast television, you know, the use of, of kind of flat lighting, uh, sort of saturated color, you know, the elimination of shadow, you know, this sort of sensibility that you see in um, stadium sports or some, some, something of that, of that nature. And, uh, and <clears throat> Starting with with Cree Master Five, I would say uh, we got into a more cinematic language with lighting, with um, with uh, and with storytelling, and um, and I think that that start, it, it, I think it started with 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 Five because of the nature of the location, in a way that it, that it was wanting to be as romantic as it could possibly be, you know, or this 
that we were capable of making at that time. Um, and uh, <clears throat> and what did that? I guess it led to uh, it led into a deeper exploration into uh, you know how the project be could become more cin cinematic, and um, and so we did abandon that kind of broadcast sensibility, and um, and so. I think one of the things that also fell away was a more direct uh, sort of biological um, framework uh, that you have with four and one and um, in the way that the, uh, I think what, what's being uh, rendered is really a, a body, you know, whether it's the stadium or the island and, and you're, um, you know, you're, the narrative is describing uh, in a somewhat anatomical way, in my opinion, um, a kind of um, a, a, an aspect of the body. And, uh, and as the work became more cinematic, the, uh, I, th I think that's true, the body became more um, psychological, became a more psychological description. And um, I think those two things happen simultaneously. I don't, I don't feel, the answer to your question, I don't feel that was influenced necessarily by the writing around the work. I think it was, uh, it was the way that the work was growing organically. And, uh, you know, as we, uh, uh, a uh, filmmaking collective, were learning how to make a film. I mean, that's also important to say that over those 10 years, we changed a lot as a, as a collaboration. And, um, you know, I've worked with the same uh, cinematographer since I graduated college and his background is not cinema, you know, it's, he worked with Nam June Pike before me and um, so as we wanted the work to become more cinematic, um, we both had to learn how to do that because not, neither of us really knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. That's another, that's another level to this whole idea of testing mm -hmm. that is going on in each of the, the films. So you're saying there's a kind of technological testing, a testing of how far you can push the language at the same time as you're putting yourself through this uh, series of um, uh, endu endurances, really. Of, of, um, I mean, so how important is this, this, this kind of idea of the... Uh, of, 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 of the, the test, the physical test. Well, it's, it's certainly been important in other aspects of my work. I think, uh, and I think those productions were run with that same spirit, let's say. Um, although I don't think that was necessarily the point of it. I think it was the habit, you know, right. to, uh, to keep it small as a production and to do it ourselves. And uh, I mean, I think that that's something at the time that the work was being made was probably misunderstood, that it was a very small people, group of people making relative to what it was. Um, it was, you know, a, an extension of the, the studio, the sculpture studio making these films with, you know, by the time Cree Master 3 was made, I mean, that was really a feature film ambition, you know, but it was still uh, made essentially by my studio. Yeah. In, in the, um, mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've asked you this before, but, you know, how much do you think about the potential reception of the work? whilst you're in the process of, of shaping it. Where is the audience for you? Mm. Well, one thing that I've, I've been thinking a lot about recently with River of Fundament is that I think one of the things that motivated me to make the piece uh, was thinking back to Cree Master and thinking about a scene like the Salt Flats rodeo scene or the Demolition Derby in the Chrysler Lobby. Um, uh, 
I mean, there were a number of these scenes that were quite compelling to be witnessed to, you know? And I think that the, the audience in that case was really the crew. And it's something that I think we always knew when we were making it, that, that in a way the film is never gonna be as compelling as what we're looking at right now, and what's in front of us. And, um, and that, uh, you know, Jonathan Bepler and I always talked about that, about how, you know, his, his background is much more in, in, in theater than, than mine is live performance. And he's like, why don't you stage things live? I mean, it would be really worth trying. And, um, and so we always had that in our, in our minds, but it, it, was always, it, was, it was always provoked by thinking about those, those Cree Master scenes. And, um, and I think, there is something to the, you know, thinking about who the audience is and, and that the audience is effectively the people working on it in a way, you know. I think I, that the, there's always this moment when the work's finished and you present it first to the, to the crew and it's the most important screening, really. That I mean, in, in River <clears throat> of Fundament, you've actually kind of built an audience you know, into the performances, to, you know, mm -hmm. so that, that's enlarged. Mm -hmm. um, but I was wondering, even, even in on a much smaller scale, um, there are uh, various uh, uh, ca characters or, or um, people in, in the films who sort of seem to have some sort of function as a kind of chorus, or they kind of, either they either comment on the action or they kind of help nudge it along, you know. I mean, there is a choir, obviously, in, in, in Crow Master 2, and, and, you know, even the, the, water, the water spirits in the last film, they sort of almost like have a function, a bit like a chorus in, mm -hmm. in a Greek tragedy, even if they're not kind of cutting away to tell the audience what's going on. They... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if I follow your question, I think that there is some way in which the that the audience uh, or the viewer needs to uh, connect the locations. That, that, and, and that that was much more so, I think, in the way that the work was distributed, so to speak, mm -hmm. that, that it was the, the chapters were made out of order and they were exhibited as they were made. So um, there was, an in, I think, an interest in, I had in in the uh, the role that the viewer plays in in making those connections, connecting one chapter to the next, and putting the narrative together, um, and um, it felt to me like a way of of uh, uh, keeping the sort of nonlinear um, concept of the work. Um, intact and um, and I think as you're saying that there there are moments in the new film um, where an audience is pre present and there's it, it's it's different but it it relates and, it, and it, I think in this case it has to do with the responsibility that those people have who are there um, as witnesses to an action which um, which I think is different from what an audience, a passive audience does, you know? And I, th and I think we thought a lot about how many people um, make a witness group and then how many people make an audience, you know, and what the difference is. And um, so it is it's some, something I have been thinking about. And I, th I think in, in Cree Master, it was a little bit more abstract um, what the responsibility of the viewer was, but... Um, mm -hmm. So Omar, in his introduction, talked about the Whitechapel's relationship to a um, uh, great um, male American artist. I think those were the four, um, four artists that Omar mentioned. I can't remember all of them, but there was Pollock and Rauschenberg. And, uh, um, you know, I hope you don't mind me asking. I mean, is there any sort of conscious on your part about trying to take on this 
tradition of the, this, this heritage of the great American epic work, whether it's on the scale of, of uh, action painting or, or uh, the history of the great novel in America, you know, Melville, whatever. Is that something you can comment on? I mean, I think I was, as, as I said before, I think that the, the American earthworks were uh, on my mind for sure. And, um, and, and uh, I mean, I think, f you know, for me, those works have all of that, that level of, of epic that, um, you know, when you think of Spiral Jetty, for example, um, I mean, it has, that quality to it. So, I mean, on that level, yes. You know, I think I was uh, certainly thinking in those terms. Um, I mean, in, in narrative terms, probably not so much. On the other hand, I think River of Fundament takes it on a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, it's probably time to uh, ask for a few questions from the floor. Um, oh, some hands coming up already. I'm going to start with, how are we going to do this? Is there a roving mic? Okay, so, so like a lay, uh, yeah, with the, yeah, with the yellow there. Um, Hi. Um, in, the, in the book, the Cree Master Cycle book published by Guggenheim, um, it contains a glossary and lots of the, um, the definitions are just passages from um, Girard's uh, Violence in the Sacred. Um, I was wondering how, like, do you see that text as a way into, a way into the work, or? Uh, I mean, well, I didn't compile oh, did that, that glossary. No, it was, it was written by um, a curator named Neville Wakefield. And, um, you know, Neville and I certainly spoke a lot during the production of the project. And, um, and so I do feel like a lot of the references he made, you know, are to do with those conversations we had, but I did not compile that, that glossary. Have you read the book? <laughs> <laughs> Which was the book you mentioned? Violence and... Violence in the Sacred. No, I have not, no. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we can't really hear you, so you need the mic back Sorry, again. The, the book is like filled with references to that book oh, okay. and like constantly quoted in the Guggenheim published text, the, you know, the big white one. <laughs> okay, good. Right, could we have the question at the front here, please? Yep, just right at the front row here. Hello. Um, I, um, I wanted to ask you about the Craymaster 3 and thinking about the kind of argument that kind of went on between the two different types of sculptural practice, um, particularly the character being punished um, for going against the kind of Masonic tradition of carving. And I know, obviously, you're sculpture is very much about casting, so I don't know if you want to talk about something about these two different types of, you know, this may be a kind of argument or an opposition between casting and carving. Hmm. Well, I mean, it's an interesting question. The, um, I mean, certainly the, the, the scene in the elevator was, was sort of based on that. It was sort of based on the um, the shortcut that the apprentice was making by casting what's called the ashlar block, right? And, um, you know, rather than carving it. So, um, you know, taking a, the mold of the elevator that already has perfect sides and just filling it with, with uh, cement. Um, so on that level, for sure, I mean, there was a... Um, an interest in that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if there's, <clears throat> I 
I mean, there's something that I've been thinking a lot about recently with the, the work that I've been making uh, around the River Fundament narrative, which is largely cast metal. And um, it started with a, uh, a casting that was made um, in iron, and it was poured directly into the ground so in a more medieval way. And, um, and it opened up a whole uh, body of work, really, in, in, uh, in different um, metals and, uh, and a kind of progression through the alloys from, you know, starting with iron and the base metals and moving through various alloys. Um, and it made me think about some of the work that was made around the time of Drawing Restraint 9 or in, in Cremaster, the, the cast pieces that, that really use the same um, language as the, the cast metal pieces, but they rely so much on these um, hybrid materials and um, um, a kind of uh, uh, an artifice, you know, an artificiality that is um, that the work was very much about, you know, and uh, and so I, I think the the, um, the the transition that that has happened recently with this new body of work is, is it's related to your question. It's not exactly uh, about that. Bo in both cases, they're cast, but um, it has to do with ar the artificiality. I think about like at what to what extent the artificial is. Um, um, you know, abandon and this sort of real condition is taken on. And, um, but I think these kinds of thresholds that almost become moral in a way are, are often set up in, in the, the work, you know, where there's a kind of um, threshold between um, what is, uh, acceptable and what isn't acceptable, and, uh, and, it, and it often leads to uh, scenes in the narrative, you know, where, you know, the conflict in the scene is really about that threshold, and um, that is certainly one of them, the elevator scene, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, there's a... Yeah, just, just on the aisle there, there's a, yep, yep, this person there, and then the next one will be gentlemen. Yeah. Hi. Um, I want to ask, my friend and I were talking about in Cremaster 4, um, the scene where your character jumps into the water and then goes through the tunnel. Mm -hmm. That looked incredibly claustrophobic and uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and I imagine you obviously had a lot of prosthetics on as well. And I was just wondering what the experience was like filming that and how long it took. Uh... I think we, it took us a couple of days in that tunnel. Um, I don't really remember, but I, I do remember putting that suit back on. <laughs> it was already, you know, completely covered in petroleum jelly. So, um, I don't know. I, I like spaces like that. You know, I, I feel good in a, a, a tight tunnel, I do. <laughs> Where did the idea for the cycle come from? Can you can you repeat that, please? Where did where, where did the idea for the cycle come from? Um, I had been making. I had been making a work uh, before that, uh, between 1991-1992, that was uh, somewhat of a trilogy. It, it, there was an exhibition in a gallery in Los Angeles, and then one in New York that were kind of uh, bookends. You know, they were um, sort of mirrors of one another. And then there was a project that I did in uh, Documenta that was kind of the centerpiece of this trilogy. And, uh, and um, to put those three 
narratives together as one thing, I think was very difficult at the time, you know, to, to suggest that that was possible or that it was gonna communicate that way at all. And so I think as much as I was engaged in that, I think I was also sort of frustrated in the fact that the way I was thinking about this piece as one form is not the way anybody else was seeing it. And, and so I think the Cremaster cycle in a way was about sort of setting out to make a work that could be that way, that could be understood that way. Um, and quite honestly, it also came at a time when I had just done these gallery shows, uh, the Whitney Biennial, the, the uh, uh, Documenta, the Venice Biennale, and I, I think I was starting to feel a little bit like I can't sustain this uh, if this is gonna be like this all the time. I didn't know, I mean, I was really just getting started. And I think I felt like I needed to slow everything down and set up a structure that I could, I could control basically, you know, that I could kind of set up the parameters of my production and when something would be shown and when it, um, so uh, there was a little bit of sort of self-preservation in the writing of the project that way, but um, yeah, there's two, two reasons anyway. <clears throat> I've got a question, actually one here that, that uh, um, if it's not obtuse to ask with your new piece coming out now and perhaps putting perspective on this series, what it is particularly uh, is difficult to talk about of this series or what you find interesting now looking back on it with a perspective coming from your new work being released, if that makes sense? Yeah, I, I think I understand. Uh, well, for sure. And it, in fact, was the way in to the new pro project that the River Fundament is based on this novel by, by Norman Mailer and uh, the, the novel was kind of in a way proposed to me by, by Mailer. He, he suggested to me that I read it and consider making an adaptation for it and I, and I read it and it reminded me so much of Cremaster 3, at least the beginning of it. The, you know, that it begins in a uh, in a burial chamber. It's a, there's a first person perspective of a, of a man who's dying. You know, he kind of comes up into this architecture and he doesn't know where he is. And he doesn't know what's happening and he starts seeing different things and starts putting uh, together what, what had happened. And uh, then these sort of uh, spirit characters start to come to him and, and he learns as he goes. So there's there's a way in which the you know, the movement of the entered apprentice through the Chrysler building sort of felt very much like that. And in the way that the Masonic tradition comes largely from Egyptian mythology, I sort of felt in a way like I had done Egyptian mythology the way I would want to do it already with, with Cremaster Three. So I, um, uh, I then started taking elements from Three and bringing them into River of Fundament. So there are aspects of, of that story in, and characters from that story in River of Fundament for that reason, I think, that it was very much the starting point of how, you know, if I was going to deal with this text, I would need to somehow recycle Cremaster Three into it and uh, sort of the notion of recycling became um, one of the, dominant threads through the piece, I would say. A question from this side of the room. So the gentleman uh, here first, in the third row. Yep, you. Was there ever a point during the production where you simply or your crew went physically or technically? That it was physically or technically impossible to achieve what you had, and you had to go to plan B, or what we just witnessed in the screen is completely true to your vision? Uh, there, in nearly every scene, there are probably, um, uh, compromises, 
you know, basically that, that were made or, um, you know, workarounds to um, the initial concept. Um, you know, for example, the, the salt ring in Utah um, on the salt flats, that was meant to be cast. Like, I wanted to cast that, that salt ring. And, um, and it, became, it became impossible with the amount of time that the Bureau of Land Management was giving us to, to do the, the, the work that we needed to do. So, you know, we ended up having to take um, basically a stacker and pour salt in a stockpile, you know, in a, in a ring. And so that's what that is. It's a stockpile of, of salt rather than a, a cast form. So that's an example um, of something that's, you know, a really ambitious idea that, that we just simply could not do. Um, and there are many others. So, I mean, um, uh, the uh, lady, yeah, you please, um, and then uh, over to you next. Would you just, could you just wait for the microphone, so okay. thank you. You're a very proficient tap dancer, and there are lots of homages to uh, musical theatre, and I wondered where that interest came from. And then a second part of my question is, do you, have you ever had any interest in actually directing a staged opera or thing, live performance in a theatre? Mm -hmm. um, well, the second question, <clears throat> The, the new piece, River Fundament, uh, started with, with the uh, concept that we would uh, make a work for the stage. And, uh, and so we started in Manchester, actually. We made a, uh, a sketch with some of the kind of preliminary ideas for the work. Uh, and um, made a performance on stage in Manchester at the at the festival up there in 2007, and um, ended up feeling like it was not the the way to tell this story. And uh, I became very frustrated with the f the fixed perspective of the stage and the the uh, you know the way that I felt like I had lost my tools. Uh, the tools that I needed to, you know, bring texture into close-up, um, you know, and to move around something. Um, and so we abandoned the notion of working on the stage and went back to this sort of site-specific sensibility that we had used with, with Cremaster, you know, even when we were performing scenes live, which, which happens in this newer piece. But... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I don't think the, I think what I learned is that in order to really, in order to work on stage, you have to really love that machine. And I think I don't, you know, I think it doesn't, um, it doesn't work for me. So, uh, and with regard to musical theater uh, and dance, I mean, I, I think I've always felt very close to dance, um, probably closer to dance than um, than to cinema, really, or to um, a lot of the other disciplines. In the way that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a there's a figure and gravity, and uh, the in the same way that um, I mean, it's like a sculptural problem that I think that I'm interested in, and. Um, <clears throat> and in terms of choreography, the, the sort of movement of the object in space, um, and, you know, my approach to sculpture, which isn't exactly about making autonomous objects, it's sort of more about creating relationships between objects. You know, I think it, it does relate to the sensibility of dance as much as it does to the tradition of sculpture or, or uh, anything else. So it's something that I've always felt very close to, to choreographers and to dance in general. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think we've probably got time for just two or three more questions. As the gentleman here has been waiting for a while. Then. 
Hi, yeah, I was um, interested in the um, collaboration that you have with your composer and how you work with the music while you are writing the cycle. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think there were different there were different conditions for sure. Some of them were were written knowing that we would be recording live um, and the music would be on screen. The perform the performance of the music would be on screen. So th those were appro approached very differently. You know, we they were we we spent a lot of time together, uh, sort of writing the scene and. Um, uh, and then there are other scenes which are scored in a more traditional way. So there was, it was a kind of combina combination of both. But, but Jonathan was definitely in, involved during the whole pre-production and production. And, um, and, and that's, I think, another thing that led to River of Fundament to, to sort of say, OK, can we, can we make an entire work where the music is considered in every scene ahead of time? You know. Uh, in terms of how what we had done in, in Cremaster relates to opera, like in certain certain scenes, and um, you know that was sort of the starting point in that conversation. Is could you, are, you know could we make a work that that would uh, function in the in the tradition of opera, whatever that means for us? You know, I think we didn't really understand when we started what that would mean. You know, would we literally make an opera, um, or would it be hybrid? And it ended up being very much a hybrid, but it, um, it did take that on, you know, to try to find, you know, the musicality in every aspect of the story and every scene and, uh, you know, for the, um, for the music to carry much of the narrative, and, uh, and it does. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, the gentleman in the front row. Sorry if there are people who really want to ask questions right at the back, but it's not so easy to see you. So. Hi. Um, in terms of how the films are distributed, I think they're quite important in the sense that um, they're event, events. It's an event whenever these films are screened. Um, is that? I take it that's something that's very important to you. You wouldn't want to distribute them in a traditional fashion. Uh, is the fact that um, it is an event as important to you as the work itself? And the other thing is, have you ever been offered any other film work? Has anyone looked at you and said, do you want to direct Star Wars 7? <laughs> because I think you would be great making a Star Wars film. <clears throat> You would think, or you, you may think. I mean, there, there have been a couple of, of, uh, of situations where somebody's asked, but I think I feel, and I have a feeling most people in that world would feel that I've, I'm, I'm spoiled, you know? That I'm, I have, uh, I'm able to make it the way that I want to make it. And, um, you know, there's a kind of, committee situation in commercial filmmaking that I've never had to deal with, you know, and I'm lucky. So, um, so I don't think there would be much to be gained by doing that for me. And um, I mean, in terms of distribution with Cremaster, it definitely, it, it uh, you know, it started out by setting up a screening, I think we did it here in London, uh, we did it in New York, where we put a video projector on the seat in the theater and, and projected it, you know, it was, uh, um, we did that at the public theater in New York, I remember, and then the cinema nearby, the film forum, invited us to show it there, and, uh, and so we did, it seemed like um, a nice opportunity. It wasn't really about um, you know, there being an ambition to, to put the thing into cinemas and to distribute it as a film, that was not the initial ambition. And um, it's, it sort of happened, and, and organically, uh, this audience that wasn't exactly a, a visual arts audience started coming to see the screenings, and it, 
And so it changed over time, and uh, eventually there was an interest in distributing the work. And um, I mean, I was always feeling like it should fulfill whatever potential it has, you know, as a project. If if it can if it can be everything that it needs to be for me, as a narrative sculpture, um, and it can also be distributed as a as a film and cinemas, then we should do it. And you know, we did that. Um, I did run into a, a situation where I wasn't able to distribute it in an unlimited way, um, mainly because I had financed the work by selling the film as an addition, and um, you know, which was sort of a more or less a break-even proposition. But it it gave me the freedom that I needed to make it, and um, you know, I was obligated to the people who had bought the work to not then distribute it in an unlimited way. So, you know, that's why the, the uh, theatrical release was sort of as far as I could go. Um, um. Mm -hmm. Right, I think we're gonna have one more question. Okay, yeah. Hand up there, please. Hi there. Um, just a quick question about the sculptures, art objects, and artifacts from the Crown Masters. Um, is there a chance that you might exhibit them separately or with the work or in the future? Um, sure, there's definitely a chance. Um, and I think some of those works, you know, are exhibited from time to time. You know, to bring them all together again would be a big effort. And uh, I mean, I hope it can happen again. Um, but there's no plan to do that right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Matthew, thank you very much indeed. Um <laughs>